Hey everyone and welcome to the Team Made Apart podcast, the podcast designed to teach those who work remotely and those who hire them how to work better together. I'm your host, Ryan Rogar. Before we get started, as always, today's show is brought to you by TeamMadeApart.com. Team Made Apart features articles, tools, and resources designed to teach remote workers and those who hire them how to work better together. A community for owners, managers, leaders, freelancers, contractors, and all variety of remote worker. Team Made Apart is also a terrific resource for companies interested in implementing remote work policies in otherwise co-located environments, or for those planning to build fully distributed organizations from the jump. Listeners of this podcast have an exciting opportunity to get involved in the remote work revolution. In light of current events related to the coronavirus pandemic and a sudden worldwide shift to remote work, we're offering a free remote work best practices guide for leaders who find themselves struggling to create a remote work policy in a pinch. Now, and for the duration of the crisis, visit teammateapart.com slash crisis to not only download your free Team Made Apart Remote Policy Primer, How to Write Remote Work Policies That Don't Suck, but to find other tools and resources to help you weather the storm. Great working relationships make for great remote work experiences, and with this free guide, you'll be better equipped to do your part in creating and maintaining a happy and sustainable remote life. Once again, to take advantage of this collection of useful resources, please visit teammateapart.com slash crisis, that is teammateapart.com slash crisis, to download your free best practices guide. One more thing before we kick off the show. Now and for the foreseeable future, TeammateApart.com is offering free support and advice to remote workers and remote leaders alike through Teammate Apart Open Office. From noon to 2 p.m. Mountain Time, Monday through Friday, you can visit TeammateApart.com and navigate to the bottom left-hand corner of the page where you'll find a chat icon. Simply click it and you'll be connected to a real, remote work expert who is happy to help you solve problems in real time at no charge to you. Of course, you can use the same tool 24-7, 365 to ask questions or request services, but during open office hours, you've got a direct line of communication to people who care and people who can help. Once again, from noon to 2 p.m. Mountain Time, Monday through Friday, simply navigate to teammateapart.com, find our chat icon in the bottom left-hand corner of the page, then click for instant support when you need it at no cost to you. Take advantage of this special program while it lasts, and now, back to the show. Today we have special guest Frank Cottle, a timeless futurist with primary expertise on the future of work. He is the founder of Alliance Virtual Offices, a company focused on building flexible workspace since 1992. Frank has dedicated his life to empowering new ways of working that unite three pivotal elements of the modern entrepreneur, people, place, and technology. Here to share his visionary insights and experiences to help our listeners explore fresh perspectives on business, lifestyle, and new ways of working, Joining us today from Newport Beach, California, please welcome to the show, Frank Cottle. Hey, Frank, welcome to the show. First, let's get right into it and talk a little bit about who you are, where you come from, and what you're doing in this space. Well, Ryan, thank you very much. I'm really glad to be here. Um, Who I am? Uh, I'm a 70-year-old serial entrepreneur that's been in business for more than 50 years. Uh, I started as a commercial diver doing uh, what was referred to as interesting work during the Vietnam era for one of our (laughs) federal agencies. Uh, Moved on from that to racing yachts and building a yacht brokerage for about a decade. Uh, Sold that uh, in the late 70s, early 80s, or sold my position out in that, uh, and started into commercial uh, property development. Uh, In commercial property, I've always specialized in things relating to the flexible workplace uh, and we started our first company developing projects specifically to host and house what were then called executive suites. So we came up with the concept back in the, uh, in fact, everybody talked about community and the name of our first company was the Commons, uh, 7980. So we, we, we started uh, thinking through those processes back then, particularly on the technology side. Uh, we did joint ventures with Bell Labs, creating the first incidents of transmitting both voice and data over a single four-pair twisted cable. That's well before things like Cat5 came along. Um, we actually created the hardware to do that with Bell Labs. Uh, we were the first incidents uh, back in the very early 80s, the first commercial uh, app, uh, application and installation of ISDN in a joint venture with GTE. 
so we've always felt the combination of people, place, and technology were critical elements to building a flexible workplace. And we've studiously pursued that in the industry for the last 40 years. Well, and Frank, and I think that's what impresses me so much about your backstory is just how like ahead of the curve you seem in some of this stuff. I mean, you know, now you hear all about the WeWorks and the the different, you know, co-working places and things like that. But, you know, you, you've been doing this for 30 years. Like this is old hat. 40 years. <laughs> that's incredible. Yeah, it's just Give me incredible. credit. <laughs> well, cool. So tell me a little bit about sort of the state of work as you see it and how you see distributed teams, you know, working in co-working environments or, or co-located environments and what you think all that sort of does, you know, in the, in the, or as contributing to the future of work. Well, you know, as we look at, at the future of work, which happens every day, uh, we, we look a lot at, at what we refer to as the, the pebble in a pond theory. Um, all activities start somewhere and then radiate outwards. Um, <clears throat> so when, when we look at activities, we say, well, what is impacting work? Well, we have societal issues. Uh, we have cultural issues. We have economic issues. We have technology issues. And each one of those issues is like dropping a pebble in a pond and then watching the waves radiate outward. Mm -hmm. But the edges of that pond are never perfect. There's a, a point sticking into the pond, a, a bay in the pond. So, so the, the impact hits different places at different times and with different force. Um, so as we look at the changes, we look at societal changes. Uh, I work Mondays and Fridays out of my home. In fact, you may be lucky enough to hear my dog bark. <laughs> love me, love my dog. Um, <clears throat> so that wasn't acceptable 10, 20 years ago uh, for a senior executive in a company. Our executive team is distributed globally. We don't believe you should have to move somebody. They should have to uproot their family in order to come have a job with us. We think the best people live where they are. Uh, they're established where they are. Their families are where they are. Uh, why do you want to explain to some executive and his family why kids have to leave their friends at school? Uh, maybe they have to ch have major lifestyle changes, et cetera, just to get a job. Technology allows us to do that today, and we're very comfortable with that. We're also comfortable and see this as a phenomena that more and more people are comfortable with that. Um, well, and what do you think that is, Frank? Do you think there's sort of like an evolution in the way, I mean, it seems like there's a lot more, I mean, you used to put on a suit to get on an airplane. We used to do a lot of things. Wait, you know? wait, don't you? <laughs> well, you know, a birthday suit usually, but that's yeah, as good okay. as it gets. So, but, um, but, you know, I mean, there seems to be a little bit of a slipping. And I think some people, you know, sort of the contrarians out there might say, you know, things are slipping or getting worse in some way or another. But I think it's actually lending to this flexibility. You know, it's putting people in positions they might not have had before. What do you think is sort of happening there? Like, what does that shift mean to you? Um, well, I I think the shift really is a, a, a global comfort. Uh, you might have used to put on a suit to get on an airplane or someone my in my generation might have. I never did because I come from a beach town and, uh, you know, I've, I've always worked casually, even when I'm in Europe. In fact, uh, years ago, I was giving a presentation in front of the, the Bundesverband, a big business group in Germany. <laughs> we were in Dusseldorf. Uh, and I had this big group, maybe a thousand or 500 to a thousand, I don't remember now, uh, uh, German executives there. And they were wanting to talk about the future of work. And this was 25 years ago, 20 years ago. <clears throat> and so I was a, a keynote speaker and I looked across this sea of gray suits in front of me. And I made, made my presentation. It was okay. And the very first question I got was, how come do you come dressed suchly to speak to us? Because <laughs> I was wearing khakis and a Hawaiian shirt. <clears throat> it was summertime, you know, <clears throat> and I thought for just a moment, I said, well, I wanted to honor them by wearing my native attire. <laughs> well, and they, all true, agreed. They, all, they all said, oh, yes, yes, yes. Well, that makes sense. Uh, so cultural differences, geographically driven in a lot of cases, um, uh, have held us back, and we try to normalize. You go to Germany, you wear a gray suit. You go to London, you wear a red tie, you, that sort of thing. But today, 
it's production. It's it's how much can you create that's important. Uh, uh, and you I still want to really you still want to dress nicely and civilly and not be sloppy at, at anything you do. Um, you know, I don't want to have a ZZ Top type beard. Okay, I probably did myself <laughs> just by mentioning that. Um, but uh, it, what matters is your ability to create and produce. And I think people have gotten much better at listening and much more concerned with looking. Yeah, and no, if you I think, think about that in business today. I think that's a skill set that has evolved. We listen to each other much better today and we look at each other a lot less. Yeah, I think that's true. So, and I think it's a really great distinction you make this idea of sort of, I mean, your joke about being, you know, your native attire, but I think it's sort of maybe symbolic of, you know, sort of a worldwide tempering or, or you know, com coming to terms with people have their differences and, you know, embracing those and that that's, that's okay. Like it's all right for you to not be the same as us in Germany or whatever. And, and I think that that sort of, I don't know, it seems symbolic of sort of the kind of acceptance you would need to really advance remote work as a, as a career. Uh, as a platform. It, it, it is. Um, uh, you let people be who they are, where they are. And, and, and that's a very important thing. Uh, to consider um, uh, as you're as you're moving along. At least that's my uh, my view. Yeah, that makes sense. So one of the big missions or big objectives of Team Made Apart is this idea of you know sort of advocating both on behalf of the workers but also on behalf of the employers. And so I like to try and ask a couple questions from each side of that coin. Um, first, I wanted to get into some of these worker questions. So in your mind, how does co-working stand up against simply working from home or your coffee shop du jour? Like, why would you choose to go to a co-working facility? Versus just, you know, somewhere you can go work for free or cheap. Well, uh, uh, number one, working, let's take working from home because I mentioned two or three examples there. Let's take working from home. Uh, I can work from home because I have a dedicated library and office just for that purpose. I've got, we were talking about bandwidth uh, a bit earlier. Uh, I've got about half a gigabyte of bandwidth just for me selfishly in my one laptop. Mm -hmm. That's it. So I've got tons of power, um, uh, lots of comfort, um, and a, a proper work environment. But I'm yeah. here with my dog, man. I'm here with my dog. That's it. <laughs> yeah, nothing wrong okay? with that. So um, unless you and I are interacting as we are right now, it can get lonely. A lot of people don't have the comfort of that. They live in uh, Manhattan. They're a young, small family. The kitchen table is the only place for the laptop. And the kids go streaming by. That's not a good work environment. Okay, so you go to you might go to your next example. You migrate over to Starbucks. Starbucks does not want you there working. Their bandwidth isn't particularly good. Um, <clears throat> get finding plugins is hard. Uh, they want you buying coffee there, um, <clears throat> and it's very disruptive to work in that environment. And if you work on anything that has any uh, sensitivity, um, intellectual property, uh, contract management, heaven forbid you, you're a primary contractor for our U.S. federal government in some way, um, you've lost all your security. You're on an open network. Um, you, you have no security. Okay. Sure. And you've got the disruption of the smelly old guy that sits next to you. <laughs> okay. Uh, and, and then migrate on from that freebie cafe hopping structure to a proper co-working center um, or a group of co-working centers is what my preference would be. Um, uh, in, a, in a business or a co-working center, you have all the people, place, and technology facility, and hopefully uh, you've got some good relationships there, not just with the staff that runs the place, but with some of your peers that are doing just what you're doing, and it becomes a very collegial and, and friendly environment. The term community is used a lot. Uh, I like it some ways, but, you know, uh, community is kind of like good sex. Everybody has a different definition. <laughs> okay, so uh, <clears throat> um, uh, what community means to one group is entirely different to another. What it might mean to you is entirely different from what it might mean to me. The concept of community is very much like the concept of family. A community can be equally productive or dysfunctional. Yeah. It just depends no, think, on the community. Yeah, I think that's true. And I think so, you're right. You know, the, you know, you, you mentioned relationships and, and I think that, 
you know, for whether you're conquering sort of loneliness or independence or whether you're trying to even further a career or grow a business or whatever, like a relationships are kind of the whole thing. So being in a situation where you're surrounded by people from different walks of life doing different things, you know, who are, I guess, generally speaking, you know, assuming you've got a good community, uh, you know, all working towards some objective or something, you know, so you've got a lot of driven people around you, you know, it can be really good for you to develop these kinds of relationships. Well, you know, community is interesting because if you take a business community and let's take a co-working facility that uses community as part of its structure, welcomes people into the center actively, introduces people throughout the center actively, helps people to network structurally, et cetera. They, they are real community advocates versus somebody that uses community on their website, uses it for SEO purposes and really sure. doesn't care. Uh, so somebody that's really an advocate to it. One of the things that we're seeing pop up is that those communities or the manager of, of those types of facilities oftentimes are taking a, a big step into corporate social responsibility as well. So that community with that particular center actually hosts a nonprofit or a charity as part of their uh, uh value system for the community and then those community members naturally um because they're interacting act, interacting together gravitate towards the support of that charity or, or nonprofit as well in many cases so there is an example of using a community not just for business purposes but for social responsibility purposes that improves the broader community of the neighborhood where the center is located yeah, um, no, I think that's true. Well, and because of the aforementioned technology and other things like that, they can actually have a reach far beyond that local center. They, they can. They, they, they really can and they do. Um, I think you have to rethink, too, um, when you talk about flexible workspace and everything. Uh, even today, I was just at a, at a, uh, speaking at a, at a the Future Offices Summit in New York uh, last week, and uh, in speaking with some of the large global fortune 1,100 companies that were there, uh, they still refer to the people that sit in desks and in offices and even in co-working centers um, working remotely as occupiers. Uh -oh. oh, we have uh, 100,000 occupiers. You know, that's I, they used to call them users, and I always thought that had to do with drug deals and stuff, <laughs> but they call them occupiers. And they want to know what their total allocable overhead cost per occupier is. Makes sense. Okay. Okay. But they use the term occupiers. And I tried to explain to them that they needed to stop thinking of occupiers and start thinking of travelers. Today, we don't go to the office. We move from the office to the Starbucks for a half an hour before our meeting across town with the person in their office. And then we go back to the co-working center, et cetera. And I also wanted people to stop and think that individuals co-work. Companies do not. Companies need privacy. They support their own culture. So if you and I, as sort of gig economy people, or maybe just independently employed by a large company as individuals, we would want to go and become part of that larger community in a co-working center. Very, very supportive. But if we started a company and hired 10 people and we're developing the newest magic techno widget, um, we'd have intellectual property to protect. We wouldn't necessarily want to be working out in the open. We'd have our own corporate culture to create. And we might be a little bit noisy and clickish. So we don't fit into that community anymore. Yeah, no, so it's one interesting of, that you bring that up. There's a, I just recently left a co-working facility that I was working out of, uh, you know, and, and the reason was like, I can understand their perspective and mine, but, you know, I'm a solopreneur individual that was coming in and working much like you've described. And then what was happening is they were filling their space with these, you know, little San Francisco or Bay Area companies that were looking for like off offsite offices here in Salt Lake sure. City. And so what happened to the community in terms of the, the networking and the relationship building and all that stuff was that you're right. All these these bigger companies siloed themselves into their little rooms mm -hmm. and they all hung out together and they all did their things. And you and all that networking sort of dried up yep. you know, in the earlier stages at the same facility when it was a lot of, you know, solo workers or little small two, three people startups 
you know, the, the community was much stronger. Everybody was looking out for each other and it was much more colloquial. But then later, uh, as these larger companies moved in, I mean, it's exactly as you described. It. Well, it, if, if you look at um, employment bases, most people work for a company. Uh, we all talk about solo converters and, and, and that sort of thing. That the term's been around for decades and decades. But the reality is, um, uh, in the 06, 07 period, as our economy went into a slide, started going into a slide, there were a lot of uh, people coming out of college. <clears throat> um, they could get jobs. And, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, if I'm a 24 year old and I'm going into the bar and trying to, hustle up a date or something, I'm not going to say, oh, yeah, I'm unemployed. I'm over at the uh, really cool little co-working center down the street, and I'm building the newest uh, app uh, that I'm going to sell to. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, 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 an entrepreneur. Okay, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. Well, you can cloak yourself uh, in uh, positively, not negative, but positively in a co-working environment and do that. But, you know, four or five years later, uh, I was pretty successful with that dating thing, and I found the right one, and uh, we got married. We have a kid. And the economy is pretty good now, and Google offered me a great job. Guess what? I'm that young millennial, unemployed, solopreneur, entrepreneur. I'm now 30 years old. I've got a great job with Google or Semantic or somebody, and I've just moved to the Silicon Slope where you are in Salt Lake City. And wow, I've made it. I need a different environment. I have matured. Yeah. So the market of customers, if you will, for the co-working industry is maturing. And we forecast this back in 07, 08. So this is what's going to happen, guys. And I almost got thrown out of one of the very first big co-working meetings. Um, we are talking about design. And everybody's saying, oh, open office, open office. Got to be this, got to that. So got to have the community all talking to each other. And I said, guys, each year for the next five or six years, you're going to convert 10% of your space to private offices. It's going to migrate about that, about that pace till you get about 70% private, about 30% total flex open, hot desking, et cetera. Boos, hisses, throw the old guy out of the room, <laughs> uh, that sort of thing. Uh, but that's what has happened. Co-working is maturing as a product, not just the community is maturing. And we're a very reactive industry. People need things, we create them and fulfill the need. And right now, we have more company builders than pure independent entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it seems the, to be. A, so the, so the, 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 the design is changing, the services are changing. It can be a lot more sophisticated uh, and, and a lot more company oriented. Yeah, well, and I think that makes sense. I mean, you know, even in my experience in the co-working facilities down here, you know, there's a, a large audience of uh, or a large swath of these people that are, you know, startup founders, people who are trying to get businesses going. And it seems like a lot of them, uh, just as they've grown and exploded on, in different categories, they they start in the co-working space kind of to get things off the ground. And mm -hmm. then, like you said, they have to eventually go on and start forming their own corporate culture and all this other stuff. So eventually they move on to their own suite and then ultimately their own building or something. And, uh, and so it almost seems like this co-working for them, at least the way they're using it is sort of this stepping stone. Um, well, well, what, what you reference, uh, in your own neighborhood of seeing, uh, companies come in, you're referencing tech companies from the Bay area, moving yeah, to Salt largely. Lake and, and opening branch office and stuff. That's the flip side of the phenomenon. Um, <clears throat> why are those tech companies using co-working and business center type space? Uh, first war for talent. They cannot recruit effectively unless the HR department coordinated with the facilities management department has a good flexible workplace program. People don't want to commute two hours to the headquarters. They, 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 they want more flexibility. So the creation of flexible workplace programs as a requirement to even be in the game of the war for talent is one side of it. The other side of it is large corporations have a lot of pressures for performance uh, for their stock value. 
And they have realized that they get rewarded more for cleaning the debt off of their balance sheet than they do even for more earnings. So there's a huge, um, I won't call it race, I'll say migration of all companies to balance the cyclicality of their workforce with the cyclicality of their debt uh, for their facilities. And leases are a debt. So if your average employee life cycle is seven years, you want your average lease life cycle to be seven years, not 10 or 15 like it was previously. Mm-hmm. And if you can shed that excess debt from your balance sheet, you materially improve your stock value and your stock performance. So that the combination of you've got to win the war for talent and you've got to shed debt, leasehold debt off your balance sheet uh, is critical. And our industry is known for one year service agreements. So no debt. Yeah, no debt. Every, but every, every occupier that you move out of a, of a 10 year lease property and into a one year service agreement property that represents probably $20,000 worth of debt that comes off your balance sheet. Oh, interesting. Okay, yeah, no, so that, that's yeah, that a big sense. driver. Yeah, that makes sense that that would be a, a large motivator. I mean, some of it, you know, seems, you know, cost-based in the first place. I mean, obviously it's cheaper to, to start this way. So it makes sense that these younger companies or less mature companies are starting in this way. Well, for all companies, but, for that yeah. practice, for that matter. I mean, if let, let's assume that you and I are uh, uh, each uh, startups mm-hmm. and we each want to borrow a million dollars. Uh, we want to get a million dollars invested from a venture capitalist. OK, right. and I, I've got a good idea and you've got a good idea. And our ideas are equal. Our experience, everything's equal between us. We go and we pitch the VC. And when we pitch the VC, the first thing they're going to ask, what are you going to do with this money? And I say, well, I'm, I'm going to open an office and I, I've got to hire a receptionist to buy some furniture and uh, I have to sign a lease and I get got to get my computer, my Wi-Fi system in, got to get some photocopiers, et cetera, et cetera. And I'll, then I'm going to go hire some engineers and we're going to do coding. And you walk in and you say, oh, what are you going to do with the money? Well, I'm moving into this little co-working center down the street and I'm going to hire engineers. Who's going to get the money? Yeah, no, it makes perfect sense. <clears throat> it's, it's funny when you put it that way because, yeah, it's a, you don't think of all that bloat, you know, that sort of was part of traditionally founding a business, you know, well, just it, getting into a place to work. And now, I'm the CEO of that company. I'm supposed to be getting my vision across to the, the, the coders and the programmers if we're in a little tech company of some sort. What am I doing? I'm administrating receptionists, and I'm making sure we have a phone system. And I'm overseeing the contract on the photocopier. These are things that no entrepreneur, no visionary, no one should have to do. So the whole concept of business centers, co-working centers, incubators, accelerators, removes that entire administrative layer and allows you to focus on the work that's productive. And that in itself is a huge advantage to companies. Huge advantage of, of all layers. Uh, if, if you're a, a branch office of a, of a big Silicon Valley tech company and your job is to go open a branch and hire six people to do your tech work. Yeah. It's the same thing. The same thing. So people are shedding these layers. Uh, and we talk about outsourcing and we think of outsourcing. We think of call centers in India, right? Yeah. But they're really, they're outsourcing the non-essential services to companies that do them faster, cheaper, better. Or as they say in the UK, it's cheap and cheerful. (laughs) Um, Okay. Well, so let's kind of circle back around and talk a little bit about your company, Alliance Virtual Offices. Well, one of many companies, but this particular uh, group of of companies. Um, One of the things, I mean, in these last 40 years working in this space, I mean, certainly you've seen the category evolve a little bit. How do you think it's, I mean, can you talk a little bit about sort of that evolution, you know, where it began as executive suites and how it sort of worked its way into co-working or as we co-working as we know it and, uh, you know, where you think it's going from here? Well, we, we started as a property development company uh, and we did land banking. Um, so we bought a piece of uh, dirt on the edge of a large master planned commercial development, usually 
we focused with Prudential, uh, Irvine Company, Travel Crow, um, uh, Chevron Land, Mobile Land, really big projects. And we'd buy a little piece out on the edge that wasn't mature yet. And we'd put up a building that was dedicated uh, and we had extra entitlement. So uh, we were land banking and we ran the buildings for five to 10 years each. And then we sold them all. Uh, we sold because we built a 30, 40,000 foot building, but we had entitlement for three, 400,000 feet. Uh, so we sold that entitlement really. But we learned to run executive suites or business centers as they became known as, as we were selling uh, back then. So call that from 80 to 90, from 90 to 2000, myself and a couple partners, uh, we all joined together and we created the Alliance company. Um, there were three of us and we called it Alliance. It made sense. Yeah, it stands for reason. <laughs> um, and um, uh, we both worked independently under that one brand. We had a fourth company that was our brand company uh, <laughs> that owned the Alliance name and, and business processes. We did all of our contracting, purchasing, HR work, et cetera, through that company. Uh, then ran our independent business centers. And we built in the aggregate between us uh, about 195 centers across the U.S. Uh, between 90 and 2000. And that uh, at that time, we were the largest privately held uh, company uh, uh, in the industry. Uh, uh, that company got merged and, and sold into uh, a couple of pieces, um, uh, but mostly merged into a merge with a company called Frontline Capital that also owned uh, HQ Global Workspaces. Um, uh, and uh, what I decided, one of my motivations for wanting to sell out of the operating company is I made a decision in the late 90s that I preferred to own the customer and not the center. And I wanted to have technology companies uh, at, rather than physical space operating companies. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to clean up my balance sheet, if you will. Sure. Uh, uh, and, and, and so uh, I came to the conclusion, you either have to own the buildings or you should own the customer. And technology companies have a better return multiple and a better value model than property companies. So I opted to a technology company. So in 2000, after we'd sold the operating companies, all three of us had sold our various parts, uh, I started, restarted the Alliance uh, group uh, as a aggregator. I looked around the, the, the world and I said, hmm, I understand travel. I'd invested in a company called Highmark, which is the largest data aggregation and reporting company in the travel industry. So I understood big data. I understood travel very well, how that industry worked. And um, I decided that I wanted our to, to model something after what was going on with travel. And I looked at uh, Expedia uh, as it just as it was spinning out of Microsoft because we had a, another company called Supply Chain that was sold to Microsoft. So we got to know some of the guys over there and thought travel and real estate were aligned. So we created um, the Alliance Virtual System, which is a aggregator, just like Expedia is. But instead of working with hotel rooms, we work with offices, virtual offices, co-working plans, uh, live reception plans, meeting and conference rooms, um, uh, call center management, things of that nature. So everything you need, uh, but someone can come to us uh, and say, hey, I need 10 offices in 10 countries and 10 cities and I need it all in 10 minutes. And they can literally just go into our websites and book and open offices globally. Same way you'd get hotel rooms or airlines or things of that nature. So I, I, I tried to shape our, our company around that. We were the first people within our industry globally to do that. Um, so well, we and it's a great idea. Um, you know, we've had a prior conversation and we talked a little bit about this, this leftover space or the space that just sitting there unoccupied <laughs> and how, you know, a system like what you've done with Alliance has made it easier to fill those spots. Not unlike Correct. the way the hotel business does it with, you know, Priceline and things like that. Uh -huh. You know, you guys are doing that with remote work. And, and I think what I like about it so much is, is the flexibility it allows a person like me who flits around a little bit and is looking for somewhere to work wherever I am. You know, I can land in Amsterdam and jump on AllianceVirtualOffices.com and pull up a property or 10 in Amsterdam, book a book a tour, go decide if that's going to be the place for me. And then I'm set for the next month. 
And yep. it's or you, all you, as easy you as can actually do that from Salt Lake City. And so when you arrive in Amsterdam, it's already great. Yeah, it's, it, um, it is very good. Uh, uh, so it works out quite well. And um, uh, we have a, a variety of companies like Alliance Virtual that we're partnered with or invested in. Uh, one in the UK, uh, based in London, called Your City Office, which does exactly the same thing, but based on UK culture that you're talking about and, and business practices. And then another in the Netherlands for Northern Europe uh, called Flexidu. You know, same, same exact model, same back end, same tech, same everything, just different brands on the front, primarily. Yeah. Um, and uh, we're invested in, in, in those companies as partners. Um, and uh, we're always looking. We have a uh, Alliance Capital Group, and we look now with a, a private equity uh, fund, and we look now and invest in uh, companies in the prop tech sector that have to do with flexible work. So that's a, a big part of our business model now. Is is we started as a developer, we came became an operator, we became a tech company, and now we're an investor. And I I see that model, that investment model. Uh, in in the technology of flexible work uh, being our next decade of activity. Yeah, well, I think it makes sense. I mean, that feels like a pretty, you know, like a smart life cycle of a, of a business to sort of chase each component as you're, you know, uh, living the circle or, you know, enduring the circle of life to use Lion King terms, I guess. Um, so I can, just see, I can see me perched up on a rock <laughs> overlooking the Serengeti. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, and then, then you could go back to your co-working space that you yeah. booked there. So yeah, that would be, be great. It. <laughs> um, so I guess then, so if this is sort of the future of things, I mean, what kinds of things, you know, if you can talk about it, I don't need to give enough trade secrets or anything, but can you talk a little bit about the types of businesses you're investing in? Like, what are you seeing as sort of coming down the, the pipe in terms of companies that are helping out flex work or co co-working? Type? Well, you know, uh, data, number one, uh, everybody needs to know what's going on. And, the more remote you get, the better your data has to be. Uh, we have a little mantra inside of the company that says, get the data. Data becomes information, which it turns to knowledge, and knowledge allows action. So get the data. Get the data. You've got to have the data. So we like things that collect information. So operating systems, booking and reservation systems, things of that nature where we can see, get a picture of what's going on. We talk about the pebble in the pond. Where are the markets moving? What kind of products are people buying? What are they paying for it? Uh, that sort of thing. So operating systems, data type uh, systems, uh, et cetera, uh, we think is important. Things like telephony, uh, things like communication systems, um, uh, uh, we think is beyond our scope and scale. Um, so we're very data focused in, in, in okay. what we're looking at. Yeah, no, I think oh. that's that's awesome. Um, can you talk about like, so if you're trying to start, a, you know, maybe you're going to start a company and you want to try and re include some sort of remote operations plan, you're trying to figure out how to include remote workers in your workforce. How would you, I, I guess, advise somebody as somebody coming from the co-working and the flexible working space and who has experience, you know, a, a broad swath of experience in that space? How would you advise founders and, you know, maybe I, I think I think I'm thinking more like companies who are sort of co-located now. And, you know, the, we discussed sort of getting debt off off of uh, balance sheets and things like that as one strategy. But if, if I was, you know, some company, we've decided we needed to implement a remote work strategy as a way to, you know, be competitive or retain employees or whatever. You know, do you have any advice or any thoughts about how that might work, how you would sort of get that going, either as it pertains to using flexible workspaces or co-working or just, you know, remote workers in general? Well, uh, I, I, I love it, Ryan, because you always ask 12 questions at once. Yeah, I know, right? Uh, <laughs> you know, somebody needs, somebody needs to train you on that a little bit. <laughs> uh, uh, no, you, you, you lay the groundwork very, very well. First, I would start by saying today all companies, we're talking about companies, now, not individuals. Today, all companies are international. I would start with that premise. They either have an employee, a contract, a customer, somewhere else that's not in their hometown, that's probably not in, even in their country. So if you and I were to start a company today, it would most likely be international, not necessarily global, but, but international. Um, and that means 
if we have to service customers uh, remotely, um, or we've got important contracts remotely, then we probably need a team to, to handle that remotely. So our industry, um, not just our company, but our entire industry caters to that, allows for that uh, to, to happen uh, much more effectively. Um, if I'm gonna hire someone in another country, um, the probability is I don't want them working out of their house. Uh, it's cheaper for me, but I'm not, it's not going to be productive and they're not going to feel like they're part of the team mm -hmm. uh, as much. And that's very important. The further people are away, the more you have to love them. Okay. <laughs> you have to bring <laughs> them in the further away they are and make them feel as if they're part of your culture. Well, I think that you're is. right because the only way they can buy into corporate culture or even really give a crap about what you guys are doing for work is, you know, they have to have some skin in the game. They have to feel... They do. And, and they have to know that you've got skin in their game, too. Yeah. So giving people proper working environments is a huge element to um, uh, growth uh, on, a, on a, and being able to scale any company. So I would be thinking about that issue a lot. Um, in terms of other motivators, uh, uh, again, it's just taking proper care of people. Um, uh, you shouldn't hire someone and say, well, you need to work out of your house. You basically need to supply me with your office space. That's not fair. Uh, so give people a proper place to work that's convenient to them. Say, oh, well, uh, you do need to go into the office, but hey, guess what? There's a daycare center right next door, or even built into the project. Um, and uh, we have complete flexible work hours. You just have to get the stuff done. But we want you in a proper work environment. Um, that, that's a, an important and engaging uh, element when you're, you're trying to build a team. Well, it seems like that's a topic that I'm seeing a lot in the news lately is this idea that if you can work from home, should your employer be paying for your internet or a portion oh, of your heat? Well, or, well that, know, that's things, a, right? actually, uh, there have been uh, several uh, uh, employee related lawsuits over the last decades uh, on just that issue. Um, hey, I've been supplying you an office for the last five years. Uh, you just fired me. Um, uh, here's to, I'm suing you for the back rent you haven't paid. Yeah. Uh, the, the other thing comes in a proper work environment from a safety point of view. Um, <clears throat> we've seen instances of uh, legal actions where uh, employers were sued by their employees uh, or their families of employees as a result of an accident occurring in or around the office. Kid sticks his finger in the back of a photocopier that's mounted in the kitchen, uh, et cetera. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, we've seen uh, proper work environment issues. And again, these are things that you should not burden the team members with. You should not burden them with that. Uh, you, 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 you should be constructive to their, their lifestyle, not, not destructive to it. Um, yeah, no, and that's all that part of building, sense. just building a good company uh, overall. And if your business model doesn't allow you enough profit uh, <laughs> to, to, to do things properly, um, well, you're you're not prepared to scale, or you need to go to work for somebody else that has enough profit in their product. Right. Um, uh, so I I think that that's very important. yeah. Well, and I think you know it, it's interesting. I'm seeing you know as we have we've kind of run around in this conversation. You know, we keep coming back to these people problems, right? It, it's really about how you treat people, the relationships you're developing, all those sorts of things, and factoring in people from the beginning versus looking at it from the other direction where I'm a company and I'm just trying to save money or I'm a company and, you know, the proper motivation seems to go a long way. In right. this world. Well, you know, the old saying, uh, that a, a, a true leader every once in a while needs to look back over their shoulder and make sure everybody's still behind them. Uh, and, and that's very, very important is not being so conceptual or so visionary, so excited about your growth that you don't make sure that the entire team is growing along with you. And that, that's really, really critical. Yeah, well, and I think it's also sort of in parallel with that. As you're a nautical guy, you know, the, the rising tide raises all ships kind of thing. Right. And right. so, and I think it's a matter of, you know, making sure that you're all, all lifting together, you know. And again, I think it comes back to proper motivation. You know, there's well, no, it is. And also, you know, you're talking about strategies and tactics and, and everything. I am a nautical guy and, and, and uh, raised a lot of, a lot of yachts or different parts of the world. And, you know, once you leave the dock, 
you're changing course. <laughs> you know, tide shift, wind shifts, weather comes in, somebody, a competitor has a different angle of attack on the wind because of a different level of efficiency than you have and you have to figure out what to do it so the moment you start a company you have to change course and i know as we raised through the years um we found that whoever steers the least with the rudder goes the fastest okay so you steer with your sails you don't steer with your rudder if you can't because a rudder is a brake it puts pressure against the water to give you yeah. the course adjustment sure. so that slows you down but if you can keep the rudder straight and just adjust with your sails relative to what the wind is doing you can still come up you can still come down and you can't do it as quickly that means you have to have a little better strategy you have to be thinking a little further ahead and it's the same in business if you just get a couple of phases ahead of yourself in your strategy and stay there all the time always be thinking what do I do next year, not what do I do today? What do I do 10 years from now? So that you can make those micro adjustments, you will go faster. And that's very important, I think, in business today. Yeah. Frank, you know what? I think that is great advice, and I don't know that we're going to do any better. So before we get out of here, let, um, let people know where they can learn more about your products and services. Also, I mean, you do a lot of other things like sort of advocacy for remote work and co-working space and through some of your other platforms, feel free to mention anything else. Well, I'll, 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 I'll give you the, the, the trinity of <laughs> the big trinity, <laughs> if you will, for us. Uh, the first would be Alliance Virtual Offices. Uh, that's one of our flagships. And uh, that's uh, easy to, uh, like I say, 10 countries, 10, 10 minutes, 10 offices. Uh, we can open offices for people anywhere in the world, large companies, small companies. Um, in fact, our largest single client today we handle over eleven thousand uh, uh accounts for oh wow so you know and our smallest one obviously had one account for sure. uh, uh, so um alliance virtual offices.com is where to reach that that company and, and i i'm listed there as well uh the next thing i'll mention is if you just want to know about our industry if you want to understand what's going on in the flexible workspace sector uh, we publish a site as a service to the industry. It's one of those intentional, unintentional nonprofits uh, <laughs> um, uh, called allwork.space. Allwork.space, so all workspace. Um, that publication is by far, there's over 100,000 articles read every month, a couple million people connected in, in, in the social media reach. So that is the big resource there's a research library there there's a daily digest of news articles from all over the world there's our own original content in there that's the big source it's all work that say subscribe to that and stay current on flexible workspace and it's free so it's, it's like i say it's a, a service we provide to the industry on that rising tide floats all ships yeah uh, that thing. and then lastly um we're very uh, grateful and proud to have established the All Good Work Foundation. Uh, so All Good Work Space Foundation. And uh, that can be reached through allgoodwork.org. That foundation takes underutilized space throughout the flexible workspace industry uh, and uh, aggregates that space in much the same way we do with Alliance Virtual. But instead of selling it, we use that space to provide support for local nonprofits and charities uh, that are in the communities where the centers are, are located. And uh, we have a, uh, I don't know the exact number, but I'll say 150 or so facilities across the U.S. providing space right now, growing constantly. Um, that is something, if one's interested in that or one supports a nonprofit that needs space, um, reach out to allgoodwork.org. Uh, and that's uh, a, another activity of ours. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, and I think, you know, I, one of the things that I most appreciate, you know, about you, Frank, is it, not just the time spent in this, you know, particular sphere of work, but the advocacy and the hard work that you've put into sort of, you know, just giving back to the community and always being involved in sort of this, you know, whole industry. And I think, uh, I think the work you're doing is awesome. And uh, I'm grateful to have had you on to talk about it. Well, real glad to be here and uh, happy to help with anything we ever can. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much. Once again, that's Frank Cottle. It's uh, 
You can catch all his links, everything are in the, the notes here on this episode. And uh, you can check him out over at AllianceVirtualOffices.com. So cool, Frank. Well, thank you so much thank for you, doing Ryan. this. I appreciate your time. Take care, buddy. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I don't owe you anything. I don't owe you anything.